Hi, this is Mark Fletcher, and welcome to my world. Welcome to Southern Tales, Tall and Otherwise. How do you make friends? How do you get to know someone whom you don't know? How do strangers find ways to become close? And finally, why does every story involve eating chicken and taters? Like I say, it's just a Southern thing. Sit back and enjoy. This episode is sponsored by the best children's book for adults of 2019. Headley Outsmarts the World contains 25 original watercolor paintings by Roz Webb, England's top illustrator, and a story that both kids and adults will find heartwarming, funny, and a teachable moment. Find Headley Outsmarts the World at Amazon.com or follow the link on our page at BroadneckMusic.com. Southern Tales, Episode 9 tennis and the sticks tonight we're going to weave in some characters that you've already met and meet some new ones we're going to experience some more highs and lows and in the end we're going to smile just a bit so it's very important you've listened to the previous episodes but if you haven't what the hell i'm tired of telling you to i promise you the previous epi episodes are pretty cool and will help you but we're going to continue on down this road and and we're going to tell these stories. And tonight's story is pretty cool. Now, there may be some disputes about the actual facts from different people in these tales. But this is the way that I remember it. And in my opinion, every goddamn word is true. So by now, you know that I wasn't much of a baseball player. Yeah, I think I could hit pretty good. I could field okay, but I really didn't have no arm. I mean, it probably threw more like a girl, according to my always loving father. Sometime around my 11th or 12th birthday, maybe, Pop gave me some advice. He said, hey, you ain't never going to be any good at those legitimate sports. You just ain't got it in you, so I think. Maybe you need to take up, you know, some kind of goob sport. Tennis, maybe. You see, son, tennis is played by most of the spazzes and at those rich country clubs where they care more about how they look than how they actually play. Them boys are soft anyway. You ain't no athlete, I'm no athlete, but you're tough. And you can probably outcompete those kids, even if you ain't got no kind of skills. Now... I wasn't smart enough to let this hurt my feelings. I mean, this is my dad telling me the way it is, right? And, and looking back on it, I do appreciate him being honest with me. Not many dads could tell their kids that they suck, but my, but mine didn't have any problem with that. And we lived way out in the sticks, as you know, on an Army ammunition plant base. But on the base, we did have three tennis courts, as well as a great swim pool, skeet range, a softball field. I immediately got my $5 racket and went up to the courts. When I got there, I saw pretty much nothing. In fact, the first time I played, it was me and Tony Osamacher doing something that we had no idea what the hell we were doing. Soon, I would leave the pool and go up the tennis courts by myself. 
and just hit balls across the net, run over, pick them up, do it again. Then one evening I went out there, and Doc Ayler and his wife showed up. Remember Doc? Well, this is about 10 years after the previous incident we discussed in episode 1, and he was no longer a dentist. Of course, I had no idea who he was or why he was even called Doc. He was probably 60, gray-haired, and he worked on the production line at a local factory. I think maybe AT or ITT. But he loved tennis, and he was so happy that some young kid looked up to him. I remember when he brought out that newfangled aluminum tennis racket. I had never seen nothing like that before. All tennis rackets were wood, but Doc must have been one of the first people on the planet to have a Prince aluminum racket. He encouraged me and always had advice. He read a newspaper column that gave tips in the Jackson Sun. Soon I did too. I assure you, he was a great guy. But about ten years later, my dad finally told me why he was nicknamed Doc. You see, he had been the town's dentist until someone found him, apparently allegedly, I'm going to say, fondling women patients after he had put them under. Oops. And then suddenly, he was working at ITT, making electronics or something. But in the 10 or so years that I knew him, he was making up for all his wrongs, I think. I respected him and still remember him fondly. You know, more than anything else, tennis introduced me to the world. My first tennis partner was a girl named Julia, who turned out to be my best friend. We were super competitive with one another. Yeah, I was a year older, a foot taller, maybe stronger, I say probably, I have no idea. But she was damn near my equal or better in tennis. Okay, but if she was number one in my town, I was at least a strong number two. I won my first trophy in mixed doubles with her in Trenton at the Teapot Classic. Yep, they used to have a teapot festival in Trenton. Not sure if they still do, but Trenton was famous for the Teapot Festival and their speed limit signs, which to this day all still scream 31. But the next step in tennis was, you know, in tennis, West Tennessee was Jackson. Uh, Highland Park, Muse Park, great players. And I met Debbie Ward, who was the best player in our region when I was a junior. And we used to go to her matches and, and watch her play. And I was I was trying to learn. And, of course, she was a cute girl, which, you know, didn't, didn't hurt either. But we eventually became friends, which I was kind of shocked about her becoming friends with some tall, blonde kid from the sticks. Um, you know, and, and listen to this. Tennis helped push me into music even more than I was. And we're going to have a music episode soon. But what was cool was that Debbie lived down the street from Ed Martindale. Yep, Wink Martindale was his uncle. And Ed was a great basketball player at Jackson Central Mary. His teammate was John Kilzer, who was recruited by every school in America. This was one of the first tall big guys who could shoot it from anywhere. I mean, he could hit from half court. If they'd had a three-point line when John was in high school, he'd probably be Tennessee's all-time leading scorer. But one day I was over at Debbie's house, and I happened to see them shooting, and I said, hey, why don't we walk down there? Not thinking anything, but they said, hey, you want to shoot some? And so it was kind of crazy because I was not even close to either one of these guys, but I got to shoot with them and, and got to know John a little bit because he was going to Memphis State where I was going. And we kind of became friends. There will be much more later um, about how we um, got together in college and whatnot. But he became an MTV sensation in the mid-80s. You should check him out in his music, John Kilzer. And then he became a Methodist preacher while he continued to play and write songs. And, and you know, it's in the South. We all go back to Jesus. It's a Southern thing, of course. Lipton Ice Tea sponsored a national mixed doubles tournament sometime in the late 70s. And Julie and I, we played in the local qualifier in Jackson at Highland Park. We won our first match, but then faced the top seeds, James Parker and Fran Spencer, later Fran Chandler, who became the best 
uh, the top-ranked amateur woman in the world when she turned 40. Well, they were killing us, and I think it was 6-0 in the first set, and it was like 4-0 in the second when we finally got a game point. I was at the net when Julia put up a short lob. James was an unbelievable doubles player and just, I mean, he, he could hit the ball as hard as anybody. And he had an easy put away overhead, which for some reason or another, he mishit. And it slammed into my forehead at about 100 miles an hour. I was knocked out cold on the court. When I awoke, an old man named Mr. Muse, whom Muse Park was named for, was standing over me saying that he had never seen anyone hit that hard before. Great. I got up and decided I was fine and could continue. I walked to the back to discuss strategy with Julia. The first thing she says was that if I could have gotten out of the way, we would have won the point and the game, or only game. Yep, Julia was, uh, she was pretty compassionate. Not. Uh, and, and some funny things happened in tennis. Me and Fitzy were going to Trenton to enter the uh, Trenton tournament one summer. He was driving his mom's big Electra when we stopped for gas. We had already been drinking. It, it was, hey, it was afternoon, of course. So I went in and got some chicken and taters while Fitz pumped the gas. When I came out, I got in the car and we started to pull out of the parking lot. This old man in a beat-up pickup started making a bunch of hand motions and saying something to us. Of course, our 8-track was blaring Leonard Skinner, and we were sure the old man didn't like that. So Fitz gave him the bird, and we laughed and screamed some stuff at him, and we drove off to Trenton, drinking beers, eating chicken and taters, laughing about the old man. Well, when we got to Trenton to enter the tournament, Fitz, he couldn't find his wallet. Then the realization came that uh, maybe the old man was trying to tell us something like, hey, your wallet's on top of the car, dumbass. Um, yep, he was doing us a favor, and Fitzy shot him the bird, and um, yeah. Anyway, we went back to the gas station, and they said nothing been turned in, and we walked about two miles down the highway looking for the wallet. Nothing. About a week later, the wallet turned up in Fitzy's mailbox. Fitzy opened it eagerly and saw the money was gone, but there was a note. It said, I was going to give you your money back, but maybe you'll learn some manners in the future. Your middle finger cost you $53. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was a senior, we had the sophomore jo join the tennis team. His name was James, and he was, he was pretty good. He was athletic. Um, but as far as tennis, he just needed experience. I could tell that, that he had potential. You know, I, I didn't know him. I knew he had a cute sister who was a cheerleader a year older than me. Of course, she had never talked to me if she even knew I existed. Uh, one Friday night, not long after James came out for tennis, I was driving my Dodge Charger down the strip when I saw him on the side of the road with a flat. I just whooped my car into the lot, and he said he didn't know how to change a tire. I opened his trunk, got out his jack, changed his tire like five minutes. Maybe it was ten. I don't know. I was pretty good at changing tires because I had to do that a lot. Um, yeah. I then jumped in my car and went back out, you know, searching for some stupid mission. James and I went on to become great friends, and there's a James podcast coming about some of the crazy stuff we did uh, in future episodes. But the coolest thing is years later he told me, he said, what I did that night cemented our friendship. He told me that about 10 of his supposedly best friends had been driving past back and forth, and not one had offered to stop and help. Then me, whom he barely knew, stopped. I helped and disappeared. I've always been proud of that, and, and proud of the friendship that James and I formed. A few years later... I was given the privilege and honor of donating blood platelets for his father's heart surgery. All because I changed a tire.
For the liner notes this episode and all episodes of the Southern Tales podcast, please go to broadneckmusic.com where you'll find more about the episode and perhaps more depth, maybe some answers to your questions. You can also find out more about our kick-ass theme music from T.R. Crooks, a little band from Paris, Tennessee. This was recorded in 1977. You'll also find our contact email address. Well, let me give it to you right now. Podcast at gmail.com. If you have any questions, just fire them off. And if you have your stories that are cool, we're going to eventually have episodes or episodes or episodes with your stories. And if we get enough questions, at the end of the season, we'll have a question and answer episode. Once again, thanks for listening, and please tell at least one friend about the fun we're having. See you next week on Southern Tales. <laughs>